Oh, they need, oh, to, they return need to return it by it December 6th. Um, um, so okay, so the group is on. And yeah, yay. Um, they're meeting again on Sundays from 5.30 to 7.30. And anybody from seventh to ninth grade is welcome. And the Woman of Enclave is on Tuesday nights. I'm part of that, yay. Um, from Tuesdays to 6.45 until about 8.30ish. Uh, it's via Zoom. And the links are in the bulletin down below with the password and everything. Um, the Men of Enclave also is on Monday nights via Zoom, 6.45. And the same thing, the links and password are on in the bulletin. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me pray us in. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us all to come together today to worship you, to glorify you, and to learn about you, Lord. I am so incredibly blessed that I am part of this family, and I ask that you just, whoever, I'm not sure who's actually doing the sermon today, but I ask that you just Bring your Holy Spirit down on him and just let him say the words, your words, Lord. Uh, I ask that everybody has a blessed day and that we all just learn and give it, give it to the next generation. Amen. Thank you, Martha. Thank you for, for that. It's good to see uh, those who have uh, come, even new faces this morning. Welcome to those who are uh, new. I'm going to take this mask off. I forgot about that for a second. Um, <clears throat> last uh, week, um, I had looked up a story that I had read before, and, and maybe it'll be familiar to you too, but it's been about a decade since this happened. But it was a story about a, a teenage girl who was walking uh, while texting in New York City, and all of a sudden, she felt the ground beneath her drop, and everything went sort of black, right? And what had happened, what she realized that had happened, is that she dropped six feet into an open manhole into raw sewage. So if you can, if you can uh, uh, imagine that. Now, it was now, painful, it was painful right? And they right? showed, and they like, showed the like the pictures of her, of her like scratches, like, scratches on her arms. arms. She had like this huge like, gouge, gouge across, across the, the, her, back. her back. And it was and also, it was also disgusting. disgusting. If you think, if you about, you think that, about that, uh, what, uh, what would be in a main line of, of, of a sewer in New York City? Well, lots of things. All right, it'd be pretty disgusting. But they lifted her up, she lost the shoe, and Sarah said, Oh, no, she, oh, no. Lost, she lost more than, more than her, than her like, shoe. Like, she, <laughs> she, she is not going to wear any of those items, items ever again. Ever again. She's, she's probably right about, right about that. Now, the people, now, the people who were there, there they, they recognized, the okay, so this, this could have been, been worse. Like if she, like was, if she was leaning just a little bit this way, a little bit that way, forward, back. She could have hit her head. It could have been It could have been really bad, right? But I wanted to bring this up so you could have that image in your mind because I want to put us through a quiz. Now, now um, this, is this is the second time, time that, I have, that I have given this quiz, this quiz but, but probably, probably most of you haven't seen this because, seen because, this because like it was like five years, years ago. ago. So, but let's, let's just take, let's this, just take this quiz together. together. So, if, so if, if you were, if you were there, there and uh, you, saw you saw this woman, woman young, lady, young lady, she's texting, she's texting while, while walking, walking, or if you see or somebody you see else and they're texting while walking toward an open manhole, like what would you do? Would you, would you, A, a would, that would that trigger you, you to remember, remember that? that? Let's go to the, Let's next, go to the slide next slide here. here. 
We just press the down button, Just press the down button, button uh, uh, Daniel. It's not going? It's not going? Maybe somebody, Maybe can, somebody help can help Daniel with that. Anyways, so, anyway, so would you, would you A, a check, to see, check to see if you have any texts? Like, is that, like is, is that, that, is that, would it trigger you to think about whether or not you had any text? Or, 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 would, or would you be, like, take this, like, take time, this to time to pull out your phone and maybe, and maybe record, record something, something that was sure to go viral, to go viral right? right? Or, or would, you would you see, try to try get, to get their attention. Their att like, hey, you're about to fall into an open manhole. Right, now, of course, joking aside, like we would say, see, <laughs> of course, see. We would try to warn them because that's the right and loving thing to do. So, okay, let's, let's complicate this for a moment. What if the person that you're trying to warn, what if they, would it still be loving for you to warn them if they loved texting more than anything and they even saw it as an expression of who they are? Like, would that, would that make any difference? Or, 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 or what if they actually, they didn't even believe in manholes, right? And anybody who talked about manholes, that was seen as offensive and oppressive. Like, would that change anything concerning whether or not it would be loving to warn them? Like, what do you guys think? Like, it wouldn't change anything, right? Because they could get severely hurt, right? And maybe some of you, like, you hear these lines of questions and you think, okay, this is getting pretty, pretty silly because who would not warn somebody about an open manhole, right? But, but if you think about it, isn't there times where we avoid talking about things that are even more serious because we're afraid of being offensive? I'm mainly thinking about like the seriousness of sin or the reality of hell. Like, we don't want to talk about those things because it might appear offensive. And maybe you, like for you, like those topics, um, they feel offensive to you. Um, and I can, I can understand that. We're not here to celebrate hell, that's, that's for, for sure. Uh, but if you're just like, I don't want to hear anything about it, um, well, this might be a, a pretty hard, like, 30 minutes for you. But I, I just, I want to encourage you to give Jesus a hearing because he wants to lovingly warn us about the dangers of sin and the reality of hell. Our passage this morning comes from Mark chapter 9. Beginning in verse 42, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than, to, than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Let's pray. Father, um, Lord, we need your help um, to, to hear what you have to say. These are, these are hard and uncomfortable sayings given by our Lord. And so, Lord, but help us to hear. 
unplug our ears, open our eyes to the beauty of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've come, Lord, to encounter him, to embrace him, to be led by him, our good shepherd, on the narrow path. Lord, we rely on you to stay on that path. God, help us now. Speak to us by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the main thing that Jesus is saying, his basic message in this passage, is to take sin seriously. Um, and, and he gives several reasons for this, right? These are the three uh, to, uh, points of our sermon this morning. One reason to take sin seriously is that you don't end up with a millstone around your neck. So that's point number one. We'll talk about millstones. Right? Another reason is that you don't want to find yourself on a path that leads to hell. That's the second point this morning. And then there's also a desire to be salt in the world. So we're going to be talking about millstones, the fires of hell, and salt. And actually, we're going to push salt off to next week, uh, Lord willing, and then just focus our attention this morning on millstones and the fires of hell. So one reason to take sin seriously is because you don't want to end up with a millstone around your neck. Remember what Jesus said in verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. So the implied command is pretty easy to pick out. Don't cause a little one to sin. But who is Jesus talking to? Well, he's actually in the middle of a conversation that he's having with his disciples as they are leaving the area of Galilee and they are making their way down to Jerusalem where Jesus is going to face a, a, a cross. And, and it's part of a response that Jesus is having to his disciples who are, um, they have certain concerns that demonstrate that they do not understand the way of the cross. Like one concern is their concern for greatness, if you remember this. They, they were arguing over who would be the greatest. So Jesus, he predicts that he's going to die on a cross and then be raised again from the dead. And immediately after that, they're walking and the disciples are arguing with each other about who would be the greatest. Now, now Jesus... He responds to that by redefining greatness. Remember this from about a month ago? He redefines greatness, and one of the ways that he redefines greatness is by taking a child into his lap, and he redefines greatness in that way, illustrating with the child as dependence on Jesus and closeness to Jesus. So that's how he's redefining it. The kingdom of God is for these type of people, like, like children, who haven't achieved anything, they have no rank in society, the kingdom of, they are the ones that are received in the kingdom of God. They are the ones who are welcomed and supported in the kingdom of God as they depend upon Jesus and, and, and are received into his lap. So Jesus is responding to that um, concern. But then there's another concern that we saw last time that was vocalized by the apostle John. His concern, and it's really the concern of the rest of the disciples with him, he's kind of like the spokesperson in this. His concern is those on the outside who are exercising power. So if you remember, John comes up to Jesus, and he's kind of expecting sort of like, good job, buddy, like when he comes up to Jesus about this. But he says, hey, Jesus, check it out. There was this guy, and he was casting out demons successfully, successfully casting out demons, relying on your power, but don't worry, I stopped him because he's not one of, one of the 12. And so Jesus then responds to this sort of like uh, emerging um, elitist attitude that is beginning to crop up within the disciples, right? And he tells them, no, no, like don't stop him because God is going to reward those who, who uh, are doing ministry in my name and who are relying on my power. 
He's going to reward those people. And so he says this in verse 41. In verse 39, he says, don't stop him. And then in verse 41, if you remember, he gives the reason. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So in other words, don't hinder the work of God. So you got verse 41, verse 42, they go together. Like they're actually part of one conversation that Jesus is, is having. And he says, don't hinder the person that is relying on me. Like don't put anything in their way because God is going to support even the smallest act of support towards somebody who belongs to me and who is relying on me. I'm going to reward that. But if you do hinder that person, like if you do put a stumbling block in their way, it won't go well for you. See, verse 42 is sort of like the flip side of verse 41. 42, remember, says, whoever causes one of these little ones to, little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for them if a great millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Now, what, what does Jesus mean? We're starting to hint at this already. But what does he mean by not causing a little one to sin? Who are the little ones? Right? In, in the context, it's those who don't have any greatness of their own. Right? They, they don't have any power of their own, but they rely on Jesus. Right? Jesus says, don't cause that person to sin. Or you could translate that to stumble, as it is translated in the NIV, or to fall away, as it is translated in, in the Christian Standard Bible. So what, what does that mean, to not cause to sin or stumble or to fall away? Well, we've seen this verb actually before. In Romans chapter 14, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, when we were in that series where we were talking about how should Christians think about government shutdowns of in-person gatherings, okay? Um, <laughs> We talked about Romans 14, and that verb was there used with reference to uh, causing those who are weak, right, the weaker and the stronger brother or sister, causing the weaker or stronger sister to go against their own conscience. This is what, part of what that verb means. But we also saw it in Mark chapter 4 in the parable of the sower, where Jesus says, hey, there's gonna, I'm going to sow the seed of my word. Right? And it's going to land on some people, but then it's not going to take root because they're going to fall away because of tribulation and because of persecution. So think about the verb being used like that in that context, and then think about this context and what the disciples are doing. What are the disciples doing to this man who is casting out demons, who, but who belongs outside of their group? They're persecuting him. He's doing work in Jesus' name. So you've got Christians persecuting Christians. So that never happens anymore. <laughs> no, it's that kind of thing still happens, right? And, and Jesus says, I, I don't want you to do that. It, it, things become even more clear if you look in the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus explains, look, People are going to be tempted in the world. It's inevitable. People are going to be tempted away from following me. But then he says this. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Right? Jesus says, take this very seriously. The implied command is, don't cause someone who is relying on me, don't lead them away from me or it's not going to go well for you, right? That's the warning. It would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. So Jesus, he's using a very graphic and grim picture here. So th that word great there actually means um, for a donkey. So like a, it's a millstone fit for a donkey to push around. So it's not a small one where you could push it with your own hand. And are the slides up? Okay, good. So it's a, it's a, action, a millstone of this size, right? like a ton of weight. Right? So 
Jesus is saying, you, you want to think about what, let me give you a word picture about what that means for you. Let's try tying this around your neck and then throwing you into the sea. Right? Jesus is, he's like going like mafia. I mean, like this is very harsh, strong language. And Jesus says, look, take sin seriously. Because you could lead somebody away from me. So that's one reason to take sin seriously. Another reason to take sin seriously is because you don't want to wind up on a path that leads to hell. This is our second point this morning. Jesus said in verse 43, beginning there, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell. To the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with feet, two feet to be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, okay, so that's pretty intense. And we're, we're kind of comfortable with Jesus talking about, we're okay with him talking about kids going on his lap, talking about humility. We're pretty okay with that Jesus. We'll put, you know, that picture up on our wall. But this Jesus, how comfortable are we with this Jesus? Because we don't, we don't really have the luxury of choosing which Jesus to follow. Right? You have to reckon with the real Jesus. And the real Jesus, he did take kids into his lap. He did, he did say all kinds of things, and he was, he was the most, he was the kindest person who ever lived. But he also said this. And what does it mean? He uses the image of a hand. He uses the image of a foot, and he uses the image of an eye. And those represent the totality of human activity. All doing, all going, all perceiving. And all of those members of your body can be used for good, for the glory of God, or they can be used for evil. Now, there's a long history of talking about the members of the body in this type of way. We see it in the oldest book of the Bible, which is the book of Job, actually. And there, Job says this in Job chapter 31. If my steps, so he's talking about his feet now, if my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. And Job is saying, look, it's possible to use your members of your body, and we know this, for evil. Right? And we have to deal with our evil. And Jesus is saying, and you need to be extreme and radical about it. Jesus suggests cutting off and plucking out. Pretty extreme. Now, maybe some of you are saying, okay, this sounds a little bit different than what we've heard in the New Testament, right? And if you think about it, yeah, that's true in a way. Jesus, where did he say sin came from earlier in Mark chapter 7? It comes from within. It comes from the heart. Let's remind ourselves of what Jesus said there in Mark chapter 7, beginning verse 21. For from within... Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. And then Paul, along the same lines, he takes up this idea, and he speaks out against putting any hope 
for holiness in asceticism or being severe to your body. Like he says it pretty clearly too, actually. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 23, there we read, these have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value, of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Or if you look back at the Old Testament, there's a prohibition against self-mutilation in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. And if you just think about it um, logically, which we shouldn't depend on our logic, but if you just think about it, any sin that you can do with two members of your body, you could probably do it pretty easily with one member of your body as well. Like If we're supposed to be trusting that the sin solution is going to come from physical surgery, well, I'll talk for myself. <laughs> it would mean a lobotomy for me. Like you'd have to take my mind because where does God, where does sin come from? From within the heart, from within the mind. So you, I could pluck out both my eyes, cut off both my hands, cut off both my feet and still sin. Oh, trust me. <laughs> just, just, just hang with me long enough and you'll know that Andrew will still sin even if you remove all the members of his body, <laughs> right? It's because it starts in the heart and it starts in the mind. So what's going on here? Is Jesus like kind of having like an off day, right? Is he uh, contradicting something he said earlier? Is he contradicting Paul? Is he going against our own experiences and what we read in the Old Testament? No, none of those things are happening. Jesus is well aware of all these things. But he wants to use the most graphic, violent language for the disciples and for us to wake up to the seriousness of sin, to, to follow Jesus and to pick up the cross is going to mean a death, a death to your, your flesh, and it's very radical. There is a war that you engage in against your flesh. Now, we're not talking about necessarily the physical body or the flesh of another person. That's what we want it to be about, the flesh of another person. We're talking about being at war with our own sinful nature. So what Jesus is saying in this passage is very similar to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 13 where we read, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Like if you make it a lifestyle of sin, if you say, I'm going to pursue sin, you will die. Like the, the, the scriptures are very clear on, on this. But then he goes on to say, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Right, so, so Paul's not talking about like turning away from sin and turning to effort in the flesh. No. Like this can't be done apart from the spirit. It's about God's grace. His grace will liberate you from your flesh by the spirit. Uh, Paul says something very similar in, in Romans chapter 6 where he's talking about how we are made alive in Christ and dead to sin. So the picture is death and sin. It, it, it says, man, I used to have a slave around here. Where did that slave go? Well, that slave must be dead. right? So that's, that's the picture that Paul is using. And then he goes on to say in verse 12, let not sin therefore. If that's true, Paul says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions, right? We're enticed by sin, aren't we? Do not present your members, right? hand, foot, eyes. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. So God is saying, turn from sin, not to effort, but turn to me. 
and I will change you from the inside out. I will save you from sin. Not just the penalty of sin. That's true. But I'll save you from the power of sin. And eventually I'm going to save you from the presence of sin. In heaven there is no sin. <laughs> I mean, is that amazing? I can't even imagine that. I can't go five minutes without sinning. But God's going to deliver us. And he's saying, take sin seriously. And we need to hear it, don't we? And the disciples need to hear it. Because what do we make the kingdom of God about? We make it about battling other people. And so the disciples and we, we don't want to hear about Jesus relinquishing all of his rights and allowing a, a, an oppressive government put him on a cross. We want, about how, we want to hear about Jesus helping us like stand up for our rights. That's what we want Jesus to tell us. We don't want to hear Jesus talk about like laying down his life in service to others and then calling us to do that. We don't want to do that. We want to use other people so we can be known as great. Right? We don't want to celebrate other people's ministries because we want to like, have an exclusive claim about that. Look at us. We're enclave. <laughs> Look at all the great things that we do. We want it to be about that. Right? But we're in a war. Like We are in a war. Part of the enemy's plan is to convince you that you're not in a war. But you're in a war. It's a spiritual war. But this war is not a battle against other people. It's actually even not about your rights. Like not even a little bit about your rights. I'm sorry to tell you that. But it, it is a war right, against sin, against death, against the devil. And it is a war that Jesus has decisively won. That's the good news of the gospel through the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. But Jesus invites us to participate, just like what Daniel was talking about last week, the serpent-crushing party. Jesus invites us to join in the victory and to take sin seriously and to turn to him. So we're talking about sin kind of like in this abstract, non-specific kind of way. And that's somewhat intentional because God wants to speak to all of you. Right? But what if you just opened up your heart just for a moment now and said, God, this is really scary for me to ask you this. But what is it that you want to deal with in me next? There's an idol that you're holding on to. There's an idol that I'm holding on to that I don't think is that bad. And you don't think your idol's that bad. And, and Jesus says, I love you. I want to do surgery on your heart so that you won't be crippled by that anymore. I want to save you from sin. And he's very serious about it because sin is a life or death issue. Right? We trivialize it. But listen to Jesus. Verse 43, he said, it is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. In verse 45, he says, it is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. In verse 47, he says, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with no eyes than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus is laying out two paths. Right? There is the kingdom of God. There's the way of the kingdom that leads to life. But then there is the way of sin that leads to death and to hell. Now, now when Jesus talks about kingdom, 
the, his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and, the, and life. Did you see how he, he says them in the same breath? Right? You enter into both life and into the kingdom because eternal life is in large part about submitting to this good king. Right? Sometimes in Christian circles, they talk about Christian the, the, uh, eternal life, but they don't talk about, they leave out the part of submitting to a good king. But the New Testament, like that's nonsense to the New Testament. Life is always found under the reign of the loving king of Jesus. It doesn't happen another way. It's not mentally assenting regarding some facts concerning Jesus. That's not how the New Testament talks about it. Life comes from submitting to King Jesus. And Mark presents this beautiful picture of Jesus, our King, who sort of arises as a, as, as a way, a path in the wilderness, right? That, that those who belong to him go on that lead to the promised land. It's, he's bringing us out of an exodus. And so you, you hear the exodus story, right? And you hear the echoes of the exodus that Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 35, Isaiah 40 and onward. And Mark says, yes, that exodus that you're familiar with, that's happening right now in Jesus the King. He's the path, he's the way, the truth, and the life. He is life, and he leads to life when you belong to Jesus. So the kingdom of God, there's the way of the kingdom of God, and that leads to life. But then there's the way of sin, and it leads to death and hell. And Jesus uses a very graphic word here to give us an understanding of what he means by hell. Several words are translated hell in the, in the New Testament, but this one is Gehenna, right, which is a Greek transliteration of two Hebrew words, Gehinnom, right, which means valley of Hinnom, which, if you know, is this huge gorge or valley that uh, lies on the southwestern side of Jerusalem. Right? And it's the spot, it's the site where Israel, back, back in the day, Israel had under the, the, the evil leadership of Ahaz and Manasseh, <clears throat> they were sacrificing their children by way of fire to the Canaanite god of Molech, right, to kind of like win Molech's favor, something which Yahweh said he detested. It was such a wicked thought, it wouldn't even come to his mind, is how he spoke about it in, in the Old Testament. But then Jeremiah came. So Jeremiah is a prophet. God sends Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 7 and Jeremiah chapter 19, he said, because of your injustice and because of your idolatry, like the things that you call God that aren't God, right? we do the same things. Because of those things, I'm going to turn the valley of Hinnom and I'm going to rename it to be the valley of slaughter by sending the Babylonian army who will then turn that place where you slaughtered children into the fires of Molech into the place where they will dump your bodies after they slaughter you. Now to, to add to that grim picture, Isaiah, at the very last verse of Isaiah, so now he's taking that image and he's putting it within the context of the end times, like the new heavens and the new earth. He says this, and this is what Jesus quotes in our passage. So this is Isaiah 66, 24. There it says, And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die. Their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. And so this valley became a horrific image of hell, of eternal destruction that does not end. Paul talks about that in, in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. It's an eternal destruction. Because God is patient. He's very patient. 
but he's just, he's holy, he's good, he's loving. And if that's true, those characteristics of God that make him God, those demand that he not tolerate with evil in his creation forever. If he's a good God, he's going to take evil out of the world. And yes, he will send warnings. He has sent warnings. Right? The prophets warned. I'm warning you. He's sending warnings. There's a manhole. You're about to walk into the manhole. Put your phone down. Right? But if we say, no. I love my sin. It's part of who I am. How dare you tell me how to run my life? No, I won't submit to your loving reign. If we say that, then God will say some of the scariest words that he could ever say to a human being. He'll say, have it your way. You can have it your way then, and he'll give you over to sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. Eternal death. The wrath of God is revealed in Romans chapter 1 in what? Giving us over to a debased mind and a darkened heart. Because we have the wrong idea about about hell. Okay, here. Who lit the fires of Gehenna? People did. To sacrifice their kids to Molech. And then after years and generations of saying, return to me. Return to me. I'll save you. I'll forgive all your sins. Turn to me. And they said, no. And God said, well, have it your way. And the valley of Hinnom became the valley of slaughter. Hell is full of people who are having it their way. We have the wrong idea about hell. We, we picture hell as people pining to be with God. Oh, if I could only be with God. And then God is just, he's turning his back on them. And he's like, well, it's too late now. Like, that's not what's happening. Right? If hell had a door, it would be locked from the inside to get keep God at, out. Like, God wants to save you from sin because sin is actually harmful for you. Like, we want to walk through the sewage of a New York City and call that life. And then God is saying, like, I've got a way better life than that. I was like, oh, I like it down here with the rats. I'm like, okay. You see, God is, is calling to you. He has sent warnings, and he has sent his son. Because God loves the world. Right? And he will remove evil from the world because he's a good God. It's not going to be heaven on earth if hell's here. The hell that we've created. He sent his son. He lived a perfect life. And, and, and he poured out all of his wrath on his son. And his son went there willingly for you. But if you say no to his reign, and you don't accept that judgment of God on the cross as your judgment, then that wrath will be poured out on you. And that's a scary thing. And I... I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And so I've got to tell you about it. Because of love. And God is calling out to you. Take sin seriously. Don't, don't lead people who are relying on me away from me. Turn from your sin. And I will keep you on the narrow path. It's not about you. 
He is the author and perfecter of our faith. The good work that he begins in you, he will be faithful to complete it. No one can pluck somebody out of Jesus' hand. He is a good shepherd and he will lead you to the promised land if you trust him and if you cling to him. Let's pray. Father, we don't take sin seriously. And we're sorry. I just ask that now that you would, you would speak to each person. And Lord, that you would draw them so close to yourself. And, and that you would speak your words of comfort. In you is life. Pour out your life now. In Jesus Christ, by your spirit, for your glory, God, and for our joy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you who are um, comfortable, we're going to be going outside and... um, singing and worshiping our God who delivers us from sin there, if you'd like to join me.